While cops are here to help and protect citizens, what happens when they're actually secret killers in disguise? Is it Kelly? Yeah, right now you're charged with murder. And it is Kelly. No! Here are three examples of when cops try to get away with murder, starting with the horrifying case of William Talley. On the 11th of May, 2019, police received a worrying phone call explaining that former police sergeant William Talley had been in an argument with his girlfriend, Kelly Levinson. At some point during the fight, he fired gunshots at her. William quickly left the scene, stealing Kelly's truck, but was worried he may have done more damage than he realized. So I don't know anything since then. So nobody's here has been injured. No, that, that's what I told him when I called. He told me that he was in trouble. The police had to immediately treat this like a crime scene and decided to search the house to ensure Kelly's safety. There was one thing on the officers' minds, and they were all silently pleading that they wouldn't find her dead. Deputy Brown, who used to work for the house. There's a dog in there. Yep, she's right there. Sorry to get mad. Upon entering the house, evidence of some kind of physical altercation was scattered throughout. As they entered the kitchen, though, they would find Kelly's dead body lying on the ground. With all the evidence the police had, it wasn't difficult for them to determine their main suspect. But catching him was another matter. They knew that William had received both police and SWAT training, so he'd be difficult to catch. However, all of a sudden, police received a phone call informing them William had gotten into a car crash. The cops rushed to the hospital where they found their number one suspect waiting for them, bruised and bloodied. We're gonna take care of you now. Once William was discharged from the hospital, he was immediately brought to an interrogation room where the investigation would truly begin. Can I ask what my charges are? Yeah, right now you're charged with murder. You're charged with violation of open office, and you're charged who with um, who? possession of a firearm during the commission of a crime. Who? who? That's what we're hoping you can tell us. Maybe once we start talking about it a little bit. Um, it wasn't back here, was it? Who was it, Kelly? Well, was it Kyle? William mentions two names here. Becky and Kelly. Of course, we know Kelly to be his girlfriend, but William was actually married to another woman named Rebecca Talley who he'd been cheating on. William obviously appears dazed and confused, but whether this is just an act or not is another question. He'd spent multiple days in the hospital and was discharged after being medically cleared, so it's unlikely he'd still be this out of it. Regardless, it at least seems to be keeping him calm. At least for now. And you can sign this. Nobody's talking with me about things. Well, we're going to get to that. That's what we're hoping to get to. No, I'm not talking until somebody talks to me. I can tell you who, if we can get started there. And it is Kelly. No! Don't do that. No! No! Tally, come on. Tally. There's a small chance William really is this distraught over Kelly's death, but he was completely unaware of what he was doing at the time. So it seems more likely that he's actually just using this as a guise to vent and scream about how his life is pretty much finished and over a small argument with his mistress. He's also likely frustrated that he got caught so easily. Remember, this is a man with SWAT and police training. He knows how to evade the cops, but almost instantly after going on the run, his plans were shut down in an incredibly unpredictable way. William manages to calm down while the detective talks to him, but only for a few short seconds. Stop, Bill. Relax, Bill. Stop. It's all unnecessary, Bill. If you don't want to talk to us, that's fine. But let's not let's not do this, okay? Okay? Just, let's not do this. Who else to guard? Right now, you're hurting yourself. I don't care about me. 
Well, who else on earth? There's no one I keep hearing when people whisper or whispers. Okay. Well, what, 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 what whispering do you hear? No, tell me. Tell me the truth. Okay. There's no one else hurt. Okay. What you're watching is a man who knows without a doubt that he's guilty doing everything he can to try and find a way out. He's panicking and the cops were probably extremely relieved when William finally asked for a lawyer and put an end to this dramatic interrogation. However, this obviously didn't help him at all as the detectives already had all the evidence they needed to convict him and William Talley was sentenced to life behind bars. Despite William being a local cop and even knowing some of the officers involved, this case was handled perfectly. A stark contrast to that of Matthew Boynton, whose case was so weird and corrupt that the cops ended up investigating a shooting that never even happened. You know you can't give a sworn statement and lie on it. Why would you do that, Matthew? On the 15th of April, 2016, police found Jessica Boynton hidden in the closet of her home with a gunshot wound to the head and a police-issued firearm in her hand. The county sheriff reportedly ruled her dead at the scene, but there was a problem. Jessica was neither dead nor shot. After she was rushed to the hospital, the ER found no entrance wounds or bullets. Instead, they found evidence of a blunt force attack to the back of her head. This case is already incredibly confusing, but what's worse is that the police's number one suspect, Matthew Boynton, told cops that he received a text from Jessica saying she was about to commit suicide. After rushing home, he heard two gunshots coming from the house and called the police. Matthew was taken to the police station and interrogated, but was caught lying about a vital piece of evidence. This is where we join the detectives as they try to unwrap this baffling web of lies. Do you recognize that bag? Yes, that bag that Jessica let me use to put all my gym stuff in when we used to be together. Okay, so when's the last time you saw that bag? Uh, it's been a long time. Like I said, I, when I used to work out at, um, there's two gyms in Thomaston. I don't remember the name of it. I used that one, and I had a uh, gray Nike bag I used to work out in. Um, so I interchanged my stuff like protein drinks, um, powder shakes, like pre-workout, uh, workout shorts, pants, sh shoes, whatever. I put it in that bag or my Nike bag. Suspects who aren't telling the truth tend to over-explain as they feel they have something to prove to detectives. If they can give lots of information over, they think it'll convince the detective that they're not lying as they couldn't possibly make all of that up. However, in actuality, suspects telling the truth will give a more instinctual, simplified answer to the question because they don't have to think about it as much. Bear that in mind as the interview continues. So when's the last time you saw that bag? I mean, it's been a while. Like, I, don't, I don't know an exact date. I don't know. I think my stepdad, he he had it in the I think the white trailer, and that that's been a while. And he brought it, but I haven't been through it or anything. Put it in my storage thing in my house, which is like when you pull in the driveway. Mm -hmm. It's a little storage thing on the right. You open the door, and it's got all my stuff in there. I had to clean that some of it out recently. That was tossed in there, but I mean, it's in there with a bunch of my stuff, like a brown tub. I used to keep in my old patrol car with gym mm -hmm. stuff in it and work stuff. Remember, that answer was given in response to the question, when was the last time you saw this bag? Something that could have been answered in a single sentence. The detectives already knew that Matthew was lying about this bag as that's the whole reason he was brought to this second interrogation. But now they're 100% sure he's hiding something and they're about to call him out on it. All right, Matthew, I've known you a long time when y'all were in the process of moving and you moved into the house that you're at now, your residence. Did you or did you not see this bag? Yes, sir, it was in my storage room in the, in the garage. Now, why would I be holding a picture of this bag? I guess because Jessica brought it into you. Why would Jessica have it if you had it at your house? Um, I don't know. I guess somebody got it from my garage <clears> and my <throat> shed. Who would have gotten it? Um, there's a couple of people. Okay. I don't know. All right. Exactly who. The bag was completely filled with female clothes. And this is one photo of it. That's not yours. No. This whole thing might not seem like a big deal, but it's actually the root of a much bigger problem. 
This bag, along with everything in it, belonged to Jessica. So when it was discovered in Matthew's possession after he told police that he'd handed all of her belongings over, it confirmed that he had been lying under oath. Again, a small issue at first, but now that the detectives know he's comfortable lying about this, they know that almost every piece of information he's given them could be completely untrue. The bag was turned into us. We have possession of the bag. We have evidence that said it came out of your storage room. Is that true? Yes, sir. Is there anything you'd like to say? No, sir. Do you believe, do you believe that statement to be accurate and true? Not now. Did you believe it then? No, sir. Matthew has now essentially confessed to stealing the bag of Jessica's belongings and lying under oath. There is the question of why he did this, but we haven't even gotten started on the assault part of the case. Why Jessica was found unconscious in their closet after allegedly texting Matthew she was going to shoot herself. As it turns out though, the police would also never move on to that part of the case, and it remained completely unanswered. Matthew was charged with stealing and lying under oath, and after being placed on administrative leave, he resigned from the force, but went completely uncharged for whatever happened on the night of April 15th. Many people have been left wondering why that may be, but the most obvious answer lies in police corruption, and the facts that the county sheriff just so happened to be Matthew's granddad, the same sheriff who lied by pronouncing Jessica dead at the scene. What's worse is that Jessica's head trauma left her without any memory of that night, so it's likely this case will remain unsolved forever. But people thought the same about the murder of Sherry Rasmussen, which lay unsolved for 23 years, before new information revealed that the culprit was actually one of the police force's best detectives. Now you're accusing me of this? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? After decades of investigations, DNA evidence revealed that Stephanie was very likely the culprit of a murder committed in 1986. Because of the high stakes nature of the case, the detectives made sure to meticulously plan this interrogation. Stephanie was a really successful detective herself, and she had recently received records recommendations for her good work on a theft case. So the detectives used this and brought her in under the guise that they needed help with a case. I don't want to talk about this in the squad room because okay. I, I don't know who people are listening. That's true. That's and if we go to my side, everybody's always wondering what everybody else is doing. Okay. An interrogation room is a strange place for such a conversation to take place, so to put her mind at ease, detectives told her this was the place they'd least be likely to be overheard, as the case details were strictly confidential. Sherry Rasmussen's body had been found at her home after being shot three times. At the time, police suspected the murder was a result of a burglary gone wrong, but the case went cold when they couldn't identify the suspect. However, 23 years later, when revisiting the case, detectives found evidence that led them towards Stephanie, a girl who had been trapped in a love triangle with Sherry and her husband, John Rutten. So the detectives decided to bring up John's name to see how she'd react. Are you guys friends, close friends? Yeah, we're very close friends. I mean, yeah. I mean what's this all about? It's a case we're working on and it involves John and in there, there's notes and stuff that he, that he knew you and stuff. Oh yeah, I mean, we good friends. Um lived in the dorms for I lived in the dorms for two years. Was there ever any relationship or anything that developed between you guys? Yeah, I mean we dated, uh, uh -huh. you know, um, I mean, is it, what's this all about? Well, it's relating to uh, his wife. Both the detectives and Stephanie have tried to seem as friendly and relaxed as possible around each other, but Stephanie is obviously starting to get very anxious at this point. Even though the detectives gave a somewhat believable excuse, she is now in an interrogation room faced by two detectives being questioned about a girl she supposedly murdered 20 years earlier. Her breathing has become faster, and her language is defensive, and her movements have become more erratic. And you're right. I mean, if you guys are claiming that I'm a suspect, then, you know, I, I got a problem with, you know, with that. Okay. Okay? So, you know, if you're, if you're doing this as an interrogation, you're saying, hey, I'm a suspect. Well, I, now I got a problem with, you know, now you're accusing me of this? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? Obviously, you know about all the DNA stuff and things of the nature that, you know, gets done on cases nowadays. You know, if we asked you for a, a DNA swab, would you be willing to give us one? Maybe. 
Because now, 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 yes, because now, now I'm thinking I probably need to talk to a lawyer. Stephanie chooses to provide DNA evidence, hoping her willingness to help out would ultimately prove her innocence. But unfortunately for her, just five minutes later, the detectives decide they've heard enough and put her in cuffs. Months later, after a long and arduous trial, a decision was made by the jury. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Stephanie Eileen Lazarus, guilty of the crime of murder of Sherry Rasmussen. We further find the murder was of the first degree. After hiding it for 23 years, Stephanie Lazarus was finally found guilty of murder and sentenced to 27 years behind bars. If you enjoy true crime videos like this, make sure you're subscribed to see more.